Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Old Baptist Weekly. We're so thankful to have you all here. Join us for another week of, uh, of what we're trying to do here. Uh, we have in our panel today, Elder Mike Montgomery. Good to see you, Brother Mike. Good to see you, everybody. Uh, Brother Mark Rowell, how are you doing today, brother? Good. How's everybody doing? Good to see you. Good. Uh, and Elder David Montgomery? Hello. Good to see y'all. Uh, we're so thankful today to have Elder Luke Addison with us. Luke, I forgot to get from you. Which church are you at, Brother Luke? Mount Gilead. Mount Gilead. Of Baptist church. We're very glad to see you, Brother Luke. I uh, hope the Good Lord evening. has placed something on your heart for us all to hear. I'm going to check real quick just to make sure that uh, we're not having audio problems like we did last <laughs> week. Uh, it looks like we're good. Somebody in the comment section, tell it. Tell me you can hear us. Somebody. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, nobody's going to say anything. That's all right. Um, so we're going to turn to the Lord in prayer. And uh, if you'll bow with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to meet and worship your name. Uh, we're thankful for such a, a unique way that we have to uh, listen to your word and to share spiritual thoughts with one another and to worship you. We ask that you be with this dear brother as he brings a message to us. Lord, please be with our world right now. It's hurting in a very special way this season. And we ask for your divine providence upon all of us. We ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name, we pray, and amen. Amen. Brother Luke, the floor is yours. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to be with you this evening, and uh, we certainly ask that you pray for us the time that we stand before you, or in this case, sit in a rocking chair. It's a, unusual in all our live stream services. I've had to stand up because I really don't know how to preach sitting down, but uh, I do ask that y'all pray for us. We've appreciated the platform and the good fellowship that we have, and I hope that this will continue uh, as things progress. But um, the scripture that I have on my mind is uh, one that uh, is very simple scripture, but it deals with a an error and a sin that I'm afraid is uh, much more prevalent among us than we might realize. And it has a way of masking itself and, and hiding itself, and we have a way of uh, overlooking it. And as a matter of fact, some people um, take it as a good and positive thing um, among uh, individuals and uh, self-help and things of this nature. But uh, the scripture that I'd like to bring before your attention is uh, Proverbs 16 and 18. It says, pride going before destruction and a haughty spirit <clears throat> um, before a fall. And uh, again, pride to me is one of those things that is, uh, it's in each and every one of us by nature. Um, you can see it in the very first man created uh, during the fall. He begins to blame everybody but himself. Um, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. As a matter of fact, God, it's your fault because you gave me the woman. Uh, and it's, it's pride that does that. Uh, pride uh, sees you know, in oneself uh, you know, no evil, no iniquity, no sin, and uh, finds the way to uh, inflate yourself based on the corruption of others or uh, perhaps the hatred of others. But there's two um, individuals in the Old Testament I specifically want to look at just as a way to um, make us take heed unto um, the thought of pride and the thought of of being prideful. Again, I hear a lot of folks talk about they're proud of a bunch of things. It's gotten into our language about our children and about uh, perhaps our church. Oh, I'm proud of this. I'm proud of that. Um, the scripture does not speak highly of pride in any, in any regard. Pride and, and being proud is one of the things that the Lord hates. It's described in Proverbs as the six things that the Lord hates. The first one is a proud look. Um, but uh, two of them were kings, and these two kings are very interesting study. Um, they're both going to take office when they are 25 years of age. They're both going to reign for 29 years. Um, it's just an uh, interesting coincidence. But nevertheless, um, in both of them, there's some very interesting points in how that they get, um, I think, overwhelmed with themselves. 
Um, in the 14th chapter of 2 Kings, we find a king, uh, Amaziah. And uh, as he begins to reign, we find that it says that he was a good king. He did according to his father, David. Uh, but he, um, uh, but not, not like David, but he did right in the sight of God, which is actually uh, a good thing. It's a good testimony of this king because, as you know, most of the kings, it doesn't say anything good about them. It says they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, every now and then you find one that says they did right in the sight of the Lord. It's interesting that he always compares them to David, and David was uh, one that God said was a king after his own heart. Uh, he was a man after his own heart, and, he, and God chose him to be king. So they're held to that standard, and it says he did right. It says, howbeit, he didn't take away the high places, and uh, the people did sacrifice. But he did right. And then it says, as soon as it was con um, confirmed, he slew the servants that slew his father. So he did a work of um, putting um, punishment on those that had uh, slain his father. Um, and he did that because he's keeping the law of Moses. It says he did it according to what the law of Moses says, the children of murder he slew not. The father shall not be put to death for the children or the children put to death for the fathers, but everybody will be put to death for their own sin. So he's keeping the law of Moses. Um, and then he says he slew Edom in the valley uh, of salt 10,000. He took Selah by war and called the name uh, Jokthil unto this day. So we find he did a lot of good things. We find that the Lord blessed him in many ways. And then he's ready to fight with Israel. And uh, one thing I think that's always put out there to compare these kings to David is many, many times when David was about to act, he would stop and he would say unto the Lord, shall I go or shall I not? And if the Lord says go, he went. If the Lord says don't go, he didn't go. Uh, you remember the time when David was told to go into the mulberry bushes and wait. Don't go, go around the backside, sit in the mulberry bushes. And when you see the moving of the mulberry trees, then you go. And I think David was uh, the epitome of obedience under, under the commandment of God. And here we find uh, Amaziah, he just goes and he says, all right, I've whooped the Edom, I've whooped Selah. Now I'm going to go whoop Israel. I'm going to teach them a lesson. And um, he doesn't consult the Lord. And when he does so, it says Judah's put to the worst. They fled before their tents. And the result of that battle is the king of Israel took their gold, their silver, the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house and of the hostages. Uh, he took them hostage. Um, it's, um, again, um, a, a testimony to me of, of a man lifted up in pride and decides, hey, I've, done, I've been successful all this time. I'm going to be successful again. Um, the other king is Hezekiah, and if you go over to the um, 20th chapter, or really the uh, earlier than that, I believe the 18th chapter, he becomes king. Um, we find that while he's king, uh, Syria um, is going to besiege them, and he frightens all the counselors of Hezekiah. Hezekiah prays unto the Lord, and the Lord says, don't be afraid, I'm going to fight your battles. Um, and, and we're summing this up, go to 2 Kings 18, 19, 20, and, and 20. Uh, well, through 20 anyway. But nevertheless, Hezekiah believes the word of the Lord and the Lord does fight his battles. In Kings, it says he slew 185,000 men of the Assyrians. Uh, they woke up, they were dead corpses and the king of Assyria had to go home. And the, I like how Chronicle puts it. In, in Chronicles, it says he went home ashamed. Um, he slew the great men and therefore uh, the king had to go home um, ashamed because he had boasted that other nations have gods that didn't protect them. What thing, you know, why do you think your God's going to protect you? But Hezekiah knew who the true and living God was and the Lord blessed him. And it was a miraculous victory uh, for the Lord and for Israel. But then we get to the 20th chapter and Hezekiah is sick unto death. And this is where he prays and, and the Lord hears his prayer and adds to his life 15 years. Very interesting thing. I don't know why Hezekiah's uh, sorrow was so great at knowing he was going to die. I suppose it's because he had no sons to take his, his position to, to be king after him. Because we find out when he dies that his son is after him is 12 years old. So he was born during the time of this 15-year um, increase in his life. 
And perhaps Hezekiah thought, the sure mercies of David are going to end here because I have no seed. And maybe that's why he wept. So I, I can't really contemplate other than that why he was so um, distraught at, at knowing that he's going to die. Um, David was told, you know, you're going to fulfill your days. You're going to sleep with your fathers and your son's going to build um, uh, the, the house for the Lord and your seed's going to be on the throne forever. So this was a promise of the Lord. And had he uh, continued his faith in the Lord the way that he ought to, I believe he should have said, though I die, the Lord's able to raise up a seed unto David, even of the stones. That's what he, what John the Baptist said about Abraham. Don't think you have Abraham to your father. He's able with these stones to raise up seed. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Uh, even though we might not see how it could be done, we ought to keep our, our faith and our trust stayed upon him, even in a situation such as that. But again, a, a good uh, point to get out of this is he did pray and he was seeking uh, deliverance and the Lord blessed him. Uh, so our prayers are heard and our prayers, um, the Lord delights to answer them. And uh, many, many times I think he gives us the desires of our hearts and then we need to be thankful. We need to be sure that we return thanks unto him. But here, David, I mean, um, Hezekiah has unto his years, 15 years added unto his days. He's delivered and he is well. It's interesting that he wants a sign after that he's told you're going to live. And in three days, you'll go up to the house of the Lord. He says, how shall I know this? And listen to what Isaiah says, this sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. If the Lord's spoken it, we're going to have the thing that he's spoken. Um, we don't really need a sign. I know that the scripture says a Jew requires a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. However, if the Lord's spoken it, that should be good enough for it. He's the Lord. Uh, he changes not. He uh, is able to do the thing that he says he's going to do. Um, and of course, we find the, the sign is he moves the sun backwards uh, 10 degrees on the sundial. What a miraculous uh, thing that was. But then the messengers from Babylon come. And what does he do? What he should have done is uh, glorified the Lord. What he should have done is magnified the Lord and said, there's a God in Israel. But instead, he shows the Babylonians all of his house. He shows them all of his treasures. Uh, and Isaiah comes to him and says, what is it that thou hast done? Uh, what, what have they seen? He says, they've seen everything. I didn't leave anything undone that uh, was there. And he says, um, you know, because, because of this, he says, behold, the days come that all that's in thy house and which dwell, uh, which thy fathers have laid up in store shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left. Thy sons that issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away. They shall be eunuchs in the palace. And Isaiah says, I mean, uh, Hezekiah says to Isaiah, good is the word of the Lord. Not because of, not because of the condemnation of his actions, but rather because it's not going to happen during his day. He's going to not live to see it. He says, this won't happen in your day. He says it's good. Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Um, and when you look at that lesson, you say, well, how do you know he did that in pride? And if you go over to the book of uh, Second Chronicles 32, um, I believe the scriptures, um, they indicate that it was pride that did this. In those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death, prayed unto the Lord. And he spake unto him and he gave him a sign. Hezekiah rendered not according to the benefit done unto him for his heart was lifted up. There, uh, therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and upon Jerusalem. You see, his heart was lifted up when he should have been uh, humble in the, in the sight of the Lord and before the people because of the great miracle that the Lord had done for them. Um, he evidently did not humble himself at that, but he took, um, he took pride in that. And I think the the danger that we have or what we ought to take very close heed to is especially in the church is even though we've had success, we've had wonderful meetings, spiritual meetings, preachers we know have been blessed beyond measure and have um, wonderful gifts that they've been given. Nevertheless, we can't just get lifted up in pride and say, every time I go, I'm going to have that same Liberty. I've preached well out of this text before. I'll just go to that text again and I'll be blessed. Like I always have. Um, I think we ought to take heed that we not be lifted up in pride, that we continually humble ourselves before the Lord. As a matter of fact, if we're going to be healed as a land, 
the first step in doing that is to humble ourselves and pray and seek the face of the Lord and turn from our wicked ways. So uh, I, I trust that this is a message that we all can relate to and we all have had trouble uh, in dealing with the pride of our own self and our own works and so forth, um, and that we will use it to take heed and um, apply it so that we will be found as humble servants, so that at the end of our days we can say unto the Lord, I've just done my duty, I'm an unprofitable servant. So that's all I have for you, brethren. I uh, feel like it's a simple message, but it's certainly one that is difficult for me to um, uh, keep myself in check. Well, amen. amen. Wow, wonderful message. That was wonderful. Yes, it's very good. Much wow. needed. Much needed message. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I'll I'll tell you what Brother Luke told me on the phone earlier today. He he specifically requested that all questions be directed at Elder Mike Montgomery, um, <laughs> and that. <laughs> We can do that. Sure, we can. So, so that's uh, that. I just want to, I just want to leave that out there, and y'all can do with it what you will. <laughs> Thanks a lot, <laughs> dear friend. <laughs> and I still think you, the Lord bless you to preach a wonderful message for us tonight. That, if there was ever an appropriate message for today, it's the one the Lord blessed you to deliver. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank the Lord for that. And. I was thinking as you were, you're talking about Amaziah and Hezekiah, and I think I've probably read more about Hezekiah than I have Amaziah. I don't know why, but um, I get I get the feeling Hezekiah gets a, a better, uh, has a better reputation than maybe Amaziah did, but um, they both, as you pointed out, were afflicted with pride. And uh, I guess a little bit of success sometimes seeing how the Lord has delivered you has a weird impact on us and making us think, well, we're safe. You know, he's going, he's always going to deliver us no matter what. And that's true with regards to certain kinds of salvation, I think. But, but in discipleship, I, I think that he expects us to stand on our own two feet and be humble before him. So do you have any thoughts? You kind of, you kind of got into what, where, Trying to think of how the best way to ask this. Where, where did Amaziah get this idea that he? What, what, what do you think? And fought, where did he get this idea that he was so he was all that when he really was? Well, what I what I perceive is that he's had victories. Hey, I follow the law of Moses. I'm doing the law. I'm I'm righteous. I'm I'm winning victories. And I think that in his mind, I'm going to unite the two kingdoms. You know, they're mm. they're all we're all Israel, we're all Judah, yeah, we're all Judah and Israel. But I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do this, and I'm gonna bring them back together. I think all of us have been aware of of uh, splits that have happened in the church and among churches where <laughs> somebody individually would say, you know what, it's time for us to get back together, and we're just going to do it. And if the Lord's not in it then it's a mess. Yeah. And wow, if great we, point. we get lifted up in pride to think I, I can bring it about, I can affect the change. Right. I think Amen. that, um, you know, I think the way the Lord has often worked is he's, I'm not going to do anything if I'm not going to get the glory in it. So I'm going to bless you, you know, in such a way that you'll know that it's me that did it. Amen. And I act from one, I'm sorry, but actually from a side that we we've had, problems in our area that we have settled i think we've seen that this this happened that there was times we tried to do it it didn't work but then when the lord was in it there was no doubt the lord did the work yeah amen, amen. Uh, yeah. we've seen that in texas too or yeah. just how however it happened it happened and nobody made it happen but the lord made it happen yeah right great response i don't think the other brethren will come up with any better questions than i just did but i'll, I'll <laughs> take a take a line <laughs> Brother Dave, you got something on your mind. Well, I think Brother Luke needs to take 10 minutes to talk more about that, what he just got through saying. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, your sermon would have been a lot better if you added 10 more minutes on that there, Brother yeah, Luke. Well, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> killer point. I mean, seriously. How dare you not go over the time limit? 
I mean, <laughs> as much as we've spent on you, you'd think we'd get more bang for our buck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's making up for the past. Yeah, he is. Okay. All right, all right. Uh, but I was thinking, you know, uh, of Uzziah, I think, um, uh, who was a good king until he was lifted up with pride and mm. burned the, the incense and yep. the tabernacle or temple, whatever, and got angry when the priest said, this is not y- your job to do that, and he was going to hit him with the censer, I think, and the Lord turned him into a leper. Mm. Right. You know, that's uh, cried, I think, uh, will take you away from where you long to be and will separate you from that and you spend your time alone uh, estranged from those very things <clears throat> that you once loved. And I've seen that a lot of people uh, today. Uh, and I think that's one of the things about pride that, that, that is very, to me, frightening is that it can, it destroys the best things that you have and it keeps you apart from them. Mm. You know, uh, that I actually thought about that when you was, uh, when you're speaking. And so, yeah, it, 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 it's number one on the Lord's naughty list. You know, a proud look, like you said, I hate a proud look, uh, you know, pride and arrogancy, the evil way doth I hate, and uh, it's probably the easiest thing for us to uh, succumb to because we're depraved sinners and we need to watch out for it. And also, like, you know, we think, you know, I preached on this subject before, so I'm going to get up there and I'm mm. going to oh, yeah. woods on fire. But, you know, sometimes even as a congregation, we can think that like, well, we got Brother Luke Addison, man, he's, he, he can bring it. You know, we're going to have some good preaching. Mm. It's possible. It's it's possible that he's actually going to preach good today. I don't know, but you no, know, we we think we got this guy, we got that, we got all these yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. Meeting, and that's the wrong way to look at it. You right. know, boy, I think that's a, that's that's easy to do, but it, it can it's a detrimental thing, and it killed a lot of meetings, killed a lot of gifts, and I hate to see that happen. So, Brother Mike, have you ever? Uh preached a sermon that you were blessed in and thought, I'm just going to do that again. And then had it flop. You asking me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, more times than I care to admit. I mean, I, you'd think after 40 years of the ministry, you'd know <laughs> that's just a, that's an invitation to flop when you get thinking like that. And yet I still think like that. I, it's just, it floors me. You but know? if you and have I, a, if you have a blessed service, you want to go back to it. It's almost like a, a sweet well that you want to drink from again. Yeah, but, it is. But it's, it is. it's not the text. It's the Lord's spirit mm-hmm. on that occasion. That's so true. Well, I heard all the others. Yeah, he gets on a subject. My brother Mike gets on a subject, and he preaches it until it flops, and then he changes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, let brotherly love continue. Well, you know, that was both hurtful and unnecessary, but still true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's true. I, yeah, I, I get ridiculed for getting on a Romans 8 kick or an Ephesians 4 or a 5th John 6 and uh, just preach that over and over and over. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's an obsessive compulsive thing. <laughs> Who knows? But, you know, you do get, you do get into uh, – uh, a study of, of a book and you just love it. And sometimes yeah. it, and sometimes the Lord's in, in it where you preach on it more than once throughout the summer. Oh, I, I think he, he is more times than not. But if we, as ministries, we don't study as we ought, or we, we think, well, I've already studied this lesson. I've preached on it a dozen times. I'm, this is what my mind's on, but I, I don't have to restudy or reread it or remeditate. I've already got my points. Mm. So, then I, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah. yeah. It's not just true of preachers. That's true of anybody that's sincere in their study of the scriptures is that there's always a ne- another layer to peel back. Right. I've already read through the Bible. I don't have to do that again. Mm. Or, or I know the notes to sing, so I don't have to. Try to improve well, myself. The best example of what we're talking about is Mark Rowland. I know. Look at him right now. He's got a question. Look at him. <laughs> and he said, it's a good question. Go ahead, Brother Mark. 
Well, thank you, brother Mike. I appreciate that. Um, I did have, I do actually do have one question. So would you consider uh, Hezekiah's entertaining the king of Babylon and showing him everything that was in Israel and with Isaiah's response to that action, that that was the opening of the door to the beginning of Babylon coming and taking mm. Israel? We know that there's, there's, there's a lot of different things that happened that Israel was warned of ahead of Babylon, but that interaction there, to me, at least, uh, it seems like that actually cracked open the door because it's, a, uh, I mean, I'm assuming the king went back and said, you're not going to believe what I just saw down there. What do you think right. about that, Brother Luke? Well, I, I've always viewed it as the last straw that okay. they've already committed sins against me and they've followed other gods. They've established, you know, they've, they've not followed me. They've not believed me. And like, I mean, I think what you're saying, opening the door, I think that's a good way to, to view that. But I, at this point, I don't think it's, there's a way for it to turn around. Okay. I think, I think that when this happened, this is certain that this is going to happen. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there comes a time that our sins, the Lord may be long suffering towards us, but there comes a time when the punishment is not going to linger. In other words, it's certain and it's going to come upon us. Yeah. I don't know. You know, there's a scripture that says that Lord's not mocked that whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. But I have well, felt like the Lord has caused some crop failures where I've been blessed to not reap as much as I should have oh, yeah. because of his mercy. But, also because sin continues the lord says okay here it comes and there's no getting out of it you're gonna mm. you're, you're about to drink of this cup and yeah. i always viewed hezekiah's sin as the last straw that this is now set that this is how it's going to be and That's he good. was one of the better kings wasn't he hezekiah yeah. he was yeah. like under david in more ways than almost right. all of them. it's amazing I, I have a point uh, i like to add a point to brother luke's point just some, sometimes judgment can't be avoided, but it can be deferred. And I think Josiah, who came a little bit after in his good reign, I think it deferred God's judgment, at least until Josiah had been slain in battle. Uh, I don't know if it might have would have come sooner, but I kind of read in that that the Lord blessed them limit on a limited basis because of King Josiah's faithfulness to God there. But I don't know what y'all think. About that. Yeah, no, that's oh, a good I'd point, agree. David. Yeah. I agree. Do you think his uh, death was a case of God taking him mercifully yeah. out of the way or? Uh... I, exactly. That's exactly what I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, should, you he remember... have, should he have gone to war or should he have not have? I wonder sometimes. I, I don't know, but I think uh, it would have broken his heart to see what actually did happen. And yeah. I hope. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Daniel told Hezekiah to break off your, I mean, uh, told Nebuchadnezzar, break off your sins by righteousness. And then it was a year later when the judgment came. Yeah. And Jeremiah says that if, if the wicked quit doing wickedly and do righteously, yeah, right. then I'll repent of the evil I had to do to them and I would do unto them good. And if the good man quits doing the righteousness, then I'll not bless. In other words, in other words, the Lord, I think the standard is the Lord is going to bless righteousness and he's going to punish wickedness. And if the righteous cease to be righteous and his blessings will cease upon them, if the wicked cease their wickedness then his blessings may be upon them and the judgment will be taken away. Mm -hmm. But it's a and good thought. Brother David says, sometimes it's just deferred, but if, if it could be deferred for my lifetime and I'm not, I don't have to deal with it. That's, that's a pretty great blessing. Yes, sir. Brother Mike Mosley has a good comment here. It says, Paul wrote, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Continue to study God's word, never counting ourselves as having attained. He said that? Oh, yeah, Mike said that. I... What, what, was, what happened to him? He grew up. I mean, the guy is amazing. It's just amazing. <clears throat> I'm proud of him. I am too. Way to go. Point, Brother Mike. Thank you, Brother Mike. Yeah, it's a showstop. I don't know what to say now. We I, love you, I, Brother I Mike. I don't know. But, you know, what you were quoting from Jeremiah, Brother Luke, about God will not 
visit the he'll visit the sin on man for his father's sin. I think that's part of what he was saying there. But but also Moses is told that God uh, brings a judgment to uh, the father's children and the children to the seventh generation. You know, in other words, seven seven generations back. Uh, patriarch did something and the family has been suffering for it ever since. Right. And yet in Jeremiah, what Jeremiah says, it sounds like God's not going to be that. He's not going to do that in this particular case. In other words, everyone is going to be on their own uh, for him. And I guess there's, there's both that happens because Hezekiah was the one who opened the doors, brother Mark was saying. And then it looked like there was a little bit of a, uh, a lessening of, of problems with Josiah. And then finally the, the, you know, the harvest came for, for what started with Hezekiah. And, uh, and it looks like it, it, the nation of Judah was doomed from the, from what Hezekiah did, but there's no, no question that also the, the Kings that followed after him, like Manasseh, and then the ones that followed Josiah were evil and terrible kings, and that just hastened God's judgment against the nation. And so right. there's a picture of both. I, I don't know. Uh, well, the um, scripture he's quoting, he said he, he followed Moses' law, which Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither the children put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own. We may suffer some of the consequences for generations to come, like, like when people acted in pride and the splits took place, that, that affected 50, 60 yeah. years road. Yeah. But, but yeah. he says, you're not gonna be put to death for it, but the consequences certainly of our actions today will affect uh, generations to come. If they take heed unto the righteousness and they, you know, refrain from evil. But it's, yeah. it, it's kind of like um, how easy it is to, how easy say that backwards how much how difficult it is and how much time it takes to build a house and then how easy it is to just get a wrecking ball in there and tear the whole thing down exactly you yeah. know um i remember um of course everything goes back to brother bill walden in here i guess um <laughs> i remember at his funeral um one of the points dad made was uh, where he quoted that um one of the best things that you can have is a good name and Brother Bill left so many people with a good name, and he spent his life doing that. And it's, it's so easy for us of the next generation to take what he built, and if we're not good stewards of it, it's going to be torn down. Inversely of that is that if we, if we are bad stewards, if we do show pride, how many places, and Brother Luke, you, you talked about this, how many places can we point to geographically in the United States of America that were victims of poor stewardship among the primitive Baptists? And how many places um, can, can we point to where there has been good stewardship? And the underlying problems of all of that, uh, as you so ably pointed out, have been pride. It's been putting us and our ideas, and it's even so much as in this, this is what I wrote down. Um, pride, parentheses, for good, question mark. You know, acting in a way that with your best intentions and in your blindness, you don't understand that really what you're doing is for you instead of for the church. Right. I think that's at, at least... I've been guilty of that. I know I have. Uh, mm. Trying to do something for the church that simply just doesn't need to be done. And um, that's not your job. <laughs> you know, providing for the church is first and foremost on the Holy Spirit, and it's our job to follow that leadership. And it's <laughs> not our job to follow our own leadership. And so yeah. these men who, like the king you talked about, who was a good... Like Dad said, who was a good king, who was probably one of the best kings since King David. When he made poor decisions, it was a, a big problem. And it was based on pride. 
And our first job as ministers is not to be anything other than a servant. That's our first, that's not our only job, but that's our first job is to be a servant. And when we forget that, it's not just us that suffers. It's a lot of people that suffer. It's true for all of us. It's not just ministers. It's all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me just say this. Uh, I noticed on Facebook feed a a statement made by somebody named Carol Rowell. Do y'all know who that is? I've uh, never, never met. Her. Wonderful okay. lady. Yeah. <laughs> that was your cue. Uh, she has I the used to be her pastor, and I think I'm still her favorite pastor. But <laughs> I'm not her. I never was her pastor, but I think she still likes. Me. She has a word. The, the one word says two molds. Now I'm going to try to interpret oh. that one word. Because <laughs> And I'm going to get it wrong, but that's okay. That reminds me of the messenger uh, that, that wanted to tell David about the battle with Absalom. One was, wanted to go, but one was sent. And the one that wanted to go, all they, could, they didn't have the information. They weren't sent. They weren't called. They didn't study. They, if you don't study, if you don't have a, a mm. message and sent you, the best you're going to do is just raise up a tumult or just... Yeah. Say something. Just a cloud of not, not even man. Right. And uh, that's but the, the easiest that, amen you've ever had, brother Mark. <laughs> it is. That's that was uh, right down the right down the line. <laughs> I, I lobbed that one to you, brother Mark. And you, I appreciate that. Where did she get this idea about tumult? That's what I want to know. I don't know. I I can't remember. Do you, Mike? I just remember. Uh, a rather unfortunate remark that a certain preacher made when he was talking about uh, those two messengers, Cushai and, and uh, Ahimeaz, I think was the other one. Ahimeaz was the one who wanted to go. He wanted to go. And he gets there and he outruns Cushai. And all he can say is, there was nothing but a tumult. <laughs> the only, and the only way the preacher could, I forget who the preacher is, but the preacher could all he could think of was, remember those scenes in cartoons where they go, you know, the. Uh, <laughs> Hands coming out in a big old cloud of dust. That's yeah. a, you can't really see what's happening. It's just a much bunch of mess. Yeah. Somehow that image stuck in her mind. Hey, uh, yeah. yeah, Sister Sister Carol says Mike preached on it over and over and over for a few yeah. months until it flopped. Until it flopped. <laughs> <laughs> but did it flop? Did it really flop? That is a good. That's got an element of pride in it too. With that hit, a Hemias character, he was jo- Joab's brother. And he wanted to go tell David, mm-hmm. but why? Why would you want to go tell David the saddest news yeah. that there is? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's so, interesting though. You know, talking about those kings, Hezekiah and Solomon. Solomon, he's the one. The Lord said the kingdom will be divided in your son's reign because Solomon's heart had been moved mm-hmm. to follow idols because he he loved many strange women. And in a different way, but same result, uh, Hezekiah. And these are two of the finest kings Israel ever had. And the worst things that ever happened came as a result of those two men. So uh, that's, that's an object lesson for all of us. Wow. And, and one, yeah. one, other, one other point is that those were great men. They were great and, men. And we have an idea that own, pride can only afflict the great. But I, I think the smallest can be afflicted with pride Absolutely. and we yes. have to take, take heed unto them so that we not, you know, fall by the same measure. Mm, and those, yeah. and those terrible things happen at the end of their lives, you know, all mm-hmm. of that, like Dan said, all that good work. Mm. And it just upended at the very end. That's right. that is very sobering, very sober. I know, but Luke, that's been a blessing to have you on the broadcast tonight, Amen. brother. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, brother. I appreciate the invitation. We sure have enjoyed having you and, jo- and love that message and the theme of the message. I hope we remember yep. it. Amen. For, for the time to come. Yeah. Well, brethren, it's been a wonderful evening. Um, I hope all of our viewers have enjoyed the evening, felt fed by it. We'll be doing this again next week, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Do we know oh, who we have? Brother Mark! I, I know! We'll see. Oh, it's Brother Jerry Anstey. It's oh, Brother whoa. Jerry Anstey. <laughs> Brother Luke, you're the first out-of-state Texas preacher on the broadcast. I don't know if that should be considered a compliment or what, but... 
And then now we went all the way to the east, west coast, and we're going to have Brother Jerry pray for us. <laughs> Got it. Brother mm -hmm. Luke, thank you so much for being with us. It was an yes. absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, we and love you, brother. We, we love, love you, too. We, yes, we love you. And, uh, and we hope to see everybody again next week, same time with Elder Jerry and Steve from California. We're very excited to have him on. So y'all start praying for him right now and pray for all of us, and we will see everyone in a week. Everybody say bye. 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 Take care. Be safe. Peace.